We're going to take a look here in a supplemental lecture at the High and the Gothic Middle Ages. So this is coming after we looked at the Greeks and the Romans. And one of the things that we should realize is that the Romans ultimately become Christianized. And the Christianization of the Romans is going to lead to ultimately a split between the empire. So you're going to have a Eastern Catholic empire that will be the Greek Catholic empire. And then the Western empire that is centered in Rome, uh, Constantinople is the center of the Eastern empire, the Byzantine empire. In the Western empire, the center will be Rome. And the Catholic faith will become the dominant faith. And in the fall of Rome in 476, there will be a kind of shift that happens in terms of power. The shifting of power will go towards the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire will be challenged by the Islamic empires that are forming. And ultimately, the Byzantine Empire is going to fall around the 1400s. So in this time period where Rome falls, we have what's known as the Middle Ages. And in the early Middle Ages, you begin to see buildings of churches, like fortresses, and also you see kind of how the lack of a centralized bureaucracy, city, and army is starting to form other empires in the north. So the Germanic empires, we're going to get the Holy Roman Empire of Charlemagne around 800 AD. And then after Charlemagne's empire falls apart, we're going to have feudalism, and we're going to have people living on large farms, working as vassals, working as knights, and we're going to be in these Middle Ages. So in the Middle Ages, we have an establishment of monoclastic life, large farms are going to ultimately be turned into a lot of land is going to be donated to the Catholic Church and they're going to form Christian convents they're going to form large monoclastic um, compounds for living and working in other words the priests the Catholic priests and also the nuns they want to be able to be financially independent so they can pursue their spiritual life. So here in the Middle Ages, we are looking at what women are doing. Mostly women are having traditional roles. They are performing crafts. The spinning wheel is introduced. Women are also, if they're not getting married, they might be going to convents. And then they're often uh, rearing children, being married, and um, perhaps farming if they're on farms, but generally not real active in political life. One of the great women, though, of this era is Hildegard of Bingen. Bingen is a composer. She composes the Oro, the Ordo Virtuum, which is a liturgical drama, maybe the first morality play that, that we have, or at least the last surviving morality play. She wrote books on botanical and medicinal texts. She wrote songs. Uh, she also wrote her Scivias, which we see an image of here. And bookmaking was one of the arts that kind of still not only remained, but really took off in the Middle Ages, making books one at a time, and generally making mostly books that had religious tones in them. The church is controlling everything. The church is controlling public life. The church is controlling law. The church is controlling music. 
and controlling the kind of ways that people dress. You know, the very conservative kind of clothing and everything is related to how the monks and how nuns are dressing. So Hildegard, she's a rock star, she's a writer, she's involved in theater, but she also writes this book, Scivias, that is her about her visionary experiences. So she is beginning to see invisible things. She's beginning to see angels and other things. And she has enough, she has enough creative power and she's surrounded by enough wealth for her through the church to be able to get illustrators to illustrate her books and to illustrate her visions. Also in the Middle Ages, we're going to see a movement away after the Crusades. So the Crusades, which begin around 1095, were a way that the Pope was trying to get Islam out of Jerusalem. But really what it was a way to do was to get the second, third, fourth born sons, give them something to do because in feudalism, the first born son inherited everything. So what do the younger sons do who have lived a kind of privileged life by being born into wealth? Well, they would generally go on crusades and along the ways, if they weren't just looting things outright, they were meeting people and finding ways to become merchants. Then they were coming back home. They were starting guilds, maybe a, a wool guild or a furniture guild. And then when they were having enough money from being merchants and trading possibly all the way to China and the Silk Road, they were using money collectively. They were starting a charter and then they were buying land from one of the feudal lords. So now they had their own independent land. They had a place where they could sell their wares. And in these towns, which are eventually going to grow into cities, we have a bustling urban life. And an urban life where money is being passed around rather than simply working for land. The guilds and the craftsmen are going to become very important when we look at the Renaissance. Also in this time period, we're going to see the emergence of universities as well. So in the universities, we're going to have universities that are run by the church, but also these secular universities that are training professionals like doctors and lawyers, but also training people in the liberal arts, learning rhetoric, learning how to read and write, and learning specific maybe philosophy or other forms of, of training and knowledge that can be useful for a professional. So there were generally three types of universities. The first type in Bologna, students hired and paid for teachers. The second type was in Paris where teachers were paid by the church. And in Oxford and Cambridge, they were supported by the king and the state. So the university is a formal institution that has its origin in medieval Christian setting. And prior to the establishment of European Europe, uh, universities, European higher education took place in Christian cathedral schools. The type of architecture that we see in the high Middle Ages around 1000 AD is called Romanesque. It has Roman type qualities. The church model is based on the cross that Christ was hung on. So it has a longer leg, kind of a shorter head. We see in these churches barrel vaults. They have a fortress-like quality to them. And there is a pilgrimage that is starting from Spain all the way into northern France. 
and a pilgrimage of all of these churches. Many of them are not in cities, but are in country settings, but there are going to be some city ones as well. So in these churches like San Fa, you have a holy relic. So you are taking a pilgrimage, exploring your faith, and then finding and worshiping the holy powers of saints. Maybe you have the crown of thorns that Christ wore. Uh, maybe you have a piece of wood from the cross that Christ was crucified upon. And all of these things were thought to have magical and possibly healing powers. The Gothic style which follows it is taller. You have the pointed arch. You have stained glass windows. And we are looking on the top image at the Basilica of Saint Denis. This is the beginning of the Gothic style with the taller steeples and the, uh, the larger transepts. The innovations are an emphasis on the divisions between massive vertical buttresses separating three doorways and horizontal string courses and window arcades marking those divisions. One of the great examples of Gothic architecture is Chartres in France and Notre Dame. This is an example of the kind of flamboyant quality of the steeples the massive areas of windows and the flying buttresses that we studied in our architecture section. The stained glass at Chartres is again another major innovation and great art form in the Middle Ages. So in the stained glass you have things like the rose window. The rose window will usually have the most important saint of the church in this case, it's the Virgin and the Christ Child. Typically then, the rose starts to flower into possibly the Apostles and might flower into other minor saints or patrons who have helped pay for the church. Colors like yellows and reds are making these stories really vivid. The light that's coming in is affected by the colors. And the whole church is kind of uh, pulsing with light and color during the day. In Gothic sculpture, we go from early Gothic sculpture to later Gothic sculpture here, where in early Gothic sculpture, there's almost no definable anatomy. The Greek anatomies are gone. In the church, the body is considered profane, the soul is considered pure. So when they are making sculptures of saints, we see nothing other than robes. By the late Gothic, we're starting to get a little bit of that contraposto back, but still not necessarily totally realistic yet, like we're going to see when we get to the Renaissance. In the three doorways to get in the church that mark, they're portals basically, that mark the difference between a secular and sacred world. You have a tympanium. And in the tympanium of St. Lazarus, we see St. Lazarus rising in the earthly king from the heavenly kingdom. And below we see demons taking people down to hell. Another innovation in the cathedrals that I think is pretty interesting are the gargoyles. So the gargoyles, we see these half human, half monster, half animal. You know, we've been seeing them all the way back to the Paleolithic age. So the gargoyles are famous on the Gothic churches. They are basically water spouts that are directing water away from the church. So these chimeras, these hybrid creatures, when it rains, they have this kind of magical quality of spitting water out of them. And they are kind of, it's not necessarily something you would expect on these 
these Christian Catholic churches. In Italy, you have an Italian Gothic. In the Italian Gothic, it has again the steeples, the flamboyance, the three entrances, the rose windows, lots of decorations, but still keeping a lot of the kind of Roman and Greek qualities of the arches and some of the circular geometric forms as well. I think my favorite of the Gothics is the Rayonette. And in the Rayonette, we see Saint Chapelle here. This is the Saint Chapelle we looked at earlier, where it appears to be all windows on the upper floor chapel. Here, you can see the rose window and all the other stained glass, making the roof seemingly really be impossible to be standing. And as I have talked about earlier, it's being held by the kind of buttresses and columns that are on the outside that appear to be somewhat invisible on the inside of the church. And then we also have a very flame-like, flamboyant steeple that is really similar maybe to the crown that a king might wear. The last thing on this really short lecture, kind of, just kind of to show you what's going on before we get to the Renaissance, this is what painting is doing in the Middle Ages. So this is one of the better painters, Simabue, probably painting mostly in tempera and gold leaf. We see painting that has very little chiaroscuro, a painting that is hieretically scaled rather than perspective, where we see the Virgin as the largest figure in this massive throne, Christ child looking very old but just small, uh, really wonderful rainbow angels. And this altarpiece, these would be paintings for the church that would be behind the priest in mass. Okay, so that was a really kind of short. I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of the transition in between what we saw from Rome. And again, we saw Rome before the Christian era, which really is another major break in the Roman history. See, it's not just you have the Republic and then you have Octavian and the emperors, but then also you have this Catholic empire that forms to around 300 AD. And then this is kind of some of what's going on in the Middle Ages. The next thing we're going to get to is the Renaissance.